So if you can qualify for these, absolutely go get one. You see how that's kind of a weird dynamic? It's confusing. It is confusing. So it makes you feel bipolar. Are 1% mortgage is a good idea? No. <laughs> Today, we're going to be talking about something that is trending online. I hear everybody talking about it or asking the question about what are these 1% mortgages yeah. in an environment where we're seeing six, seven, almost flirting with 8% mortgages. Yes. What is this 1% mortgage and is it a good idea? Are 1% mortgages a good idea? No. This is a great marketing technique. So Rocket Mortgage and United Wholesale Mortgage, they both have this product. And it's basically, so it's a 3% down conventional. And what they're doing is they're eating 2% of that. So if someone's buying a $400,000 house and we realize those don't exist in our area, but it's just simple math. Um, Normally, they'd have to have twelve thousand dollars down, uh, you know, plus some closing costs. In this case, they'd have to have four thousand dollars down. Well, where's the other eight grand coming from? It's coming out of Rocket Mortgage or United Wholesale Mortgage's pocket, and so they're paying to buy these buyers. And, and in order to qualify, you've got to be eighty percent of the median income uh, in the area. To be honest, kind of cool product. Wrong time in the market. Wrong time in the market, not because of interest rates. Wrong time in the market because the whole United States is at low inventory environment. So this is creating demand in an environment that's already got, even though, like you just said, even though interest rates are like 7%, we still have too high of demand. What we should have is we should have making developments easier, making building permits easier, not 1% mortgages. These are Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac mortgages. So I mean, th this is, these are legit government loans through a special program. And they also have no PMI. So if you can qualify for these, absolutely go get one. As a real estate investor, as a broker, I don't like it because I actually believe it's hurting the market at a, at a time when we don't need it. It's creating more demand. And with interest rates being high, and we and if you're that first time home buyer and you're gonna go buy a home in our area, about two hundred and fifty dollars a month is the private mortgage insurance. So if I take that two hundred and fifty dollars a month away, this one percent conventional buyer, which is really a three percent, now qualifies for like an extra forty grand. Okay, maybe fifty grand. What it's doing is this is creating a recipe for disaster. See, I was in real estate in 2003. Uh, we did the ninja loans. No income, no job, no documentation. It doesn't matter. We don't have to prove your income. Lie on it. You'll just go for it. Okay. Now, I don't personally believe you should have lied on it, but that's what happened. What it did was that artificial demand drove up prices more. This is simply another product that's going to drive up artificial demand. Second, people don't have skin in the game. Humans by nature, we need skin. When we don't have skin, we don't respect it. And if we don't respect it, that means we can go into foreclosure easier. Ah, it was only 1%. I should just walk away. The other way we look at it too is I realize here in the Seattle Metro, prices have started appreciating, but this is a nationwide product. There are places where prices are still depreciating. If I have 1% into it and the market went down 2%, I'm in a negative equity situation. So instantly I could go underwater. The psychological barrier to a buyer, if they are underwater, the next step for them is foreclosure, even if they can make the payment. See, in the last recession, when we did all those bank-owned properties, all those foreclosures, all those short sales, I told people over and over again, keep your home. And they would say, well, I'm underwater. And so that's my concern here is as these people get underwater, if they do, they could just walk away. The biggest one, though, is just the adding fuel to the fire. And this fire is already burning too hot. We need more affordable housing that's only going to come from making the building and the permitting process easier and streamlining it. Isn't one of the reasons mortgage companies like Rocket or United, 
the reason they're doing this is because they don't have enough business, right? Yes. Um, they want to get business going. And let me just create a hypothetical situation. I love it. Do you, can you put as much down as you want? Or it has to be like a minimal, like... I think as much as you want. All right. So let's just play this out here, okay? <laughs> Say somebody just happens to have saved a lot of money, okay? Because they were waiting to buy a house when the price is dropped and they just saving, saving, saving. But they don't necessarily make that much money, right? Maybe it's like retirees and they have minimal coming in. Or maybe it's just somebody was very frugal and just saved up money. Wouldn't this, hypothetically, if they could put enough down, be a good thing because they are getting a 1% mortgage? And is that for 30 years? Yeah. Isn't that hypothetically a good thing for that specific person? Well, it's one percent down. It's not the interest rate. Oh, got it. Okay, so it doesn't change the the interest rate is floating. It's whatever today's it. interest so rate gonna, is. For and so, th by the way, that's good that you clarified this. Yeah. Because I think a lot of people are seeing oh, this. Yes, they and they're are. thinking it's a one percent interest yes. rate mortgage. One percent down payment. But let's 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 noodle on your idea. Even if they put 5% down and owned this or did that relative to a 5% conventional, they'd still be saving the PMI. So in our area, they'd still be saving $250 a month. I mean, that would work great. As long as they met the, the other criteria, this is a great program for them. My fear, though, is that this is one of those things where it just it's easy to get foreclose on, it's easy to have negative equity, and it's creating more demand. Let's flip it over, though. Let's look at it from Rocket Mortgage and United Wholesale's uh, perspective. Their business is down like 80%. So literally, this is a marketing cost. They're buying buyers with cheap down, stop me, not cheap, lower down payments. They're buying buyers with lower down payments because what they'll do is then they can make it up on the servicing on the back end. Lenders make money on the origination of the debt and on the servicing of the debt. So they're hoping to pick it up on the back end on this one, plus earn a customer. And you should also be thinking, holy cow, this is a little bit desperate because that's an expensive lead. Maybe they need to just pay for some cheaper leads and get better people at converting loans. All right, so um, that's good. But let's talk about lending to get today. Lending. Fed. So lending because of the Fed, and we've brought this up before, but we need to reiterate this because I think the average person is missing this at an epic level. The Federal Reserve, you know, they came in, they took us from interest rates, and now I'm talking 30-year fixed debt for the consumer right now, 3% to approximately 7%. Because of the fear of what's in the market, what's happened is lenders have increased their margin. Also, they believe these loans are going to get refinanced. So they need to make money. Once again, just a couple seconds ago, they make money on the origination of the debt and the servicing. They know the loan's going to get refied quick because it's expensive when rates go down. So they have to make more on the servicing. So the servicing right now is averaging, a, or excuse me, the origination is averaging 320 basis points. Basis points you can think of as 100 basis points is a percentage point. So the average lender is adding in 320 basis points to the 10-year treasury. The normal number is 180 or 1.8%. So when I looked this morning, the 10-year treasury was 3724 if we add in the 320 basis points, or 3.2%, that would give us a mortgage of approximately 6.93%. Uh, With the normal margin being 180 basis points, 3.724 plus 1.8% would get us 5.52. So as soon as the Fed calms down, which is probably going to happen next week, this is the takeaway. Please listen. When they pause, the lenders will start compressing their margin because we just talked about Rocket fighting for a buyer. Part of the way they'll fight for the buyers, they'll start compressing the margin. 
And as they compress the margin, interest rates will naturally go down. But we don't have any supply coming, so demand is going to go up. This is coming. It will start. How long is it going to take to happen? Nobody knows. But definitely somewhere in 90 days to six months, expect to see interest rates start to move. By the time you're listening to this next week, the Fed has most likely not increased the Fed funds rate again. The Fed funds rate controls all interest rates. That's literally the overnight rate, the zero day rate. Once again, the consumer's got 30 year fixed debt. This infects investors, it affects everyone. All debt has more margin built into it right now because they believe it's going to refinance sooner. Next week, the Fed, they're gonna pause. And then, bam, all of a sudden, that's going to start shrinking over time. What happens if they don't pause? Oh, I love it. That's actually going to be a curveball. So if the Fed doesn't pause and they keep raising interest rates, the stock market's going to take a beating. And interest rates on 30-year debt for both the investor and the consumer is going to go up again. But you, if you go look at the 10-year chart, when interest rates went over 7 You can see we've got three peaks over the last, I don't know what it is, six to nine months. Just go look at the chart, chart, Google 10-year treasury, and you can see it's slightly trending down. So the market is kind of betting where we're going, and the five-year break-even rate bets that that we're getting inflation under control. So the, the strongest bet right now is they're not going to, but if they didn't, the market would respond very negatively to it. And what it means, though, is it means the Fed would believe his job is not done. The jobless claims that just came out showed a slight spike in jobless claims and people moving into these weird categories. They call them U3, U6. It means like actively looking or like I'm really, really now genuinely looking or I'm back in the labor force. Ignore all that. The number went up and there's more people actively looking. So I think the odds are low, but man, if the Fed did that, I would expect interest rates to actually have to drop faster because they will have officially over tightened at that point, in my opinion. Uh, you know how they have these almost like polls or percentages of what the expectation is broadly, and those have seemed to be pretty like correct. What On it, par. What, yeah. What is it saying right now? Are they likely to pause 68% right now? 68% chance of a pause next of week. Of a pause. So that most likely would happen. Got it. And though, see, we have to watch what the Fed is doing because they're telegraphing. They're telling us what's going to happen. They came out, you know, right after the last meeting and they went on a public speaking tour. Different Fed chair people and presidents got up, not Mr. Powell. And what they did was they used their mouthpiece to drive confidence down. So that confidence was already coming down, but there was a point two weeks ago where all of a sudden it had flip-flopped and there was a 68% chance of a hike. Now coming into this, we're back to where it looks like it's not going to be a hike. But consumer debt and just all debt is just plain expensive right now and getting more expensive. And, you know, this kind of just goes into our next topic of this consumer debt getting more expensive, commercial debt, investor debt, business debt, residential mortgage, commercial mortgage, all of it getting more expensive. This is this credit tightening that you and I have been talking about previously. I hate to say it. I think more banks are going to fail. I think banks are calling in for more reserves. I bank with a local bank. And they told me, hey, this is not for public knowledge, um, but we will pay you 4.5% on new deposits right now. I was like, whoa. I mean, that's, that's a big number. So banks are pulling in their deposits. Consumer debt on credit cards has gotten more expensive. Home equity line of credit, LTVs, have gone down. Auto debt, more expensive. The auto debt market is drying up. Used autos dropped almost 3% in sales last month. The, uh, we know the residential consumer is even still strong just due to demand, okay? But when they ticked over seven last week, it got a little quieter and it's still gonna keep going. But what's happening on the commercial debt side? Well, the commercial debt's tightening up. Lower LTVs, loan to value, 
higher debt service coverage ratios. Okay, so what that means, a debt service coverage ratio, is simply the net operating income divided by the debt service. Usually that number is 1.2. So a $2.2 million asset was making approximately, a, this is a, these are all real numbers, making approximately $150,000 a year, 26% uh, expenses, so approximately 111000 net operating income. Because the debt service went from 1.2 to 1.25, the debt service coverage ratio, they called a DSCR, that property was going to refi at 70% loan to value. It's now going to refi at 58% loan to value. This particular person, which may or may not be sitting across the table from you, called the banker and threw a fit. And he said, we're doing it to everyone. It's not just you. And I go, oh my goodness. Everyone is being pinched right now. So there's a multifamily that we're going to have that's going to be sitting at 58% loan to value and was hoping for 70% loan to value, even though the debt's expensive. Can you break that down for the more beginner a, person or for the person sitting across no from No worries. You? This is a cash out refinance. So we're trying to get as much money back. So let's just call it 2 million because it makes it math simple. 2 times 0.7 is 1.4. And they basically just told you, hey, just kidding, we're going to give you 1.2. So they're changing that debt service coverage ratio by literally 0.05, cost $200,000 in this example. Holy Toledo. Also, multiple of our other friends, their lines of credit are now being attached to real property. Or their lines of credit are being decreased. The credit crunch is real. Well, Anton, what does this mean for investors? What's the freaking takeaway? How do I make a big bag of money? If the cheap money is gone, and if it's hard for everyone to get debt or harder, it means the persistent, the consistent, and the crazies are the ones who make all the money. Well, the, the crazies, who are they? The people who are willing to hang it out there a little bit. Right now is the market where you need to start really thinking about buying because everyone can't and it's going to be very hard. So it's going to discourage a massive amount of investors. Benji, if there were 50% less investors looking at X property, could you get a better deal on it? Potentially because there's 50% less demand. Bingo. So I don't know if it's going to be 50%, but this credit tightening is going to take away 20%. 30%, maybe as much as 50%, and it depends on the category of the property. That's where it's confusing because on one side, residential properties, right? Yes. Even with high interest rates, demand is still high. People want to buy their first home or a home or upgrade, and inventory is super low. But then on this other side, right, the pendulum swinging completely opposite, 100. investors are a little hesitant banks are like hey we just aren't going to be as like uh you know free with our capital and there's not as much demand because of it for potential development deals or investors so you see how that's kind of a weird dynamic it's confusing it is confusing so it makes you feel bipolar yeah yeah so like <laughs> how do you know when this side the uh the tighter side the one that's going to slow down will affect the residential side. Today, it does not appear that commercial is going to affect the residential side at all, unless it turns into this commercial foreclosure tsunami that is possible if the Fed remains too high for too long. It'll start in office, and then that office will spread like cancer to multifamily, warehouse, industrial, farm, all of it. Office is the blight of commercial. So that's where it'll start. But if they get it under control and interest rates come down before that spreads too far, the residential person will never see it. They'll never even know what happened. This is where we've talked about this many times, but we have to reiterate this. You got to know your market. You got to know which sector you're playing in. You got to know locally how the demand is. And that's where you create the opportunities. But just even on the small investor side, the duplex, the fourplex, even those are becoming, they're not selling as fast, okay? Why? 
that's really expensive. They don't make sense. The seller doesn't want to jump their cap rate up or reduce their price. So you've got this battle that's happening all across the whole investment side of real estate right now where costs are up you know, for materials or development and cost of capital is up, but prices haven't dropped significantly to compensate. So therefore cap rates or your returns haven't compensated for it. So you just have this weird tension, like everyone's staring at each other, playing chicken, going, okay, who's going to break first? Can I play out a scenario Please. where I feel like it's not going far enough in, in this ex explanation of yours? Yeah. You said three plexes, four plexes, right? Not getting the offers. So they're maybe sitting, which to me would mean people that build those are hesitant to build. On top of it, if they are going to build, the banks aren't really lending at the same rate, right? Yeah. And so commercial, that could also be apartments, right? Yes. And just if you think about land development, well, what is land development for? To build homes, right? So inventory is actually going to get lower and lower and lower so this is where like you know with real estate it's like the aircraft carrier versus a speedboat right speedboats can take a turn do a 180 whatever yep. aircraft carrier it takes a lot longer to turn that ship yes and this is where for me again it's really hard to predict because if we went back a year to the first podcast i mean the late last year we were talking about how you know things would be way different and we just couldn't see really yep. and things played out differently. Well, actually think about this. Couldn't this affect the market in six, 12, 18 months dramatically if things just stay the same? If the Fed stays too high for too long, it'll literally be catastrophic. Like, you'll just hear this sucking sound and it will be a black hole known as commercial real estate and it will sink our whole economy. I don't believe that's going to happen. I believe, just like the stock market believes, uh, that the Fed will start lowering interest rates next year. But you're absolutely correct. And you, this is where you just have to know the market and see the opportunities. So if nobody's building duplexes right now, that's the opportunity. If people aren't flipping homes right now, that's the opportunity. You, we, people want to go where they feel comfortable and where they think the market is going. And what they do is they look for signals from everyone else and they follow the herd. I'm telling you, go opposite of the herd. All the money's made going the other direction. So whatever direction they're running, just run the opposite. The mistake, going back to what you were saying, like the aircraft carrier versus the speedboat, is because of these because of how quickly the stock market moves people expect real estate to perform the same way it's never performed that way it always moves slower a lot slower in fact when it is fast you should be skeptical of that and right? but it's only fast in appreciation wise in, in the 20 years that i've been doing this there's only two times in 20 years where i was like holy cow, it's moving. And it was actually both. It was the appreciation in 21 and 22. And then it was the downside in the third and fourth quarter of 22. Both of those times, it was literally defying statistics and logic. Even in the Great Recession, though, it was ticking down at a normal rate. Like you could, I mean, it was fast for real estate, but it wasn't like third and fourth quarter of 22. Third and fourth quarter of 22, that down cycle was so fast in the Seattle Metro, it just dropped and it was done. But also because it went up so fast and dropped so fast, we're already through it and the rest of the country is like, what are you West Coasters doing? And we're like, oh, it's, we're done with that. Like we're, we're on like Donkey Kong. Washington's um, economy just got voted one of the best economies in the United States. So as crazy as it sounds, like, the Fed might pull off this soft landing they've been talking about? Because in Washington, like, I mean, we're doing pretty well. There's a, a clear explanation of why it was so extreme in 21, 22. Yep. And then the drop off on 23, the pandemic. Yes. Lee, when you have the first three to six months, which almost seems like a movie now, right? Like a dystopian <laughs> end of the world movie when you think about it, it pause all buyers and sellers basically right for yep. a few months 
And then when things started going, because interest rates were so low, it was people catching up to what they were going to do and stealing the buyers and sellers from the future. Yes. So it's just completely artificial. It was just this weird, unique time. And so now this is the question. Well, we have to pay the dues now, right? So like, is it just going to spread this all out? I think we would have had to have paid the dues if enough inventory was created. But nationally, and especially here locally in the Seattle Metro, we have not created enough inventory to make those dues come due. And another weird thing that's pop that keeps popping up too is people are like, well, we have a, we're creating a rental nation. I see all these apartments going in. Home ownership is at the highest percentage it's been in seven years today. So even though they're building those apartment buildings, and even though we're seeing more of them and people are like, it has to be happening, it's the highest it's been in seven years. Okay? So the American dream's not dead. Is it changing? Yes. Is getting into a home harder? Yes. Do we have an affordability issue? Absolutely. And we're teaching you on this podcast how to solve that and how to make money regardless of the market being up, down, or sideways. Just keep hanging out with us and we'll teach you how to make a big bag of money. So what you're saying is if you're on the fence, call you. Call me and then also run the opposite direction of where everyone else is going. There's a lot of fear right now and most of the fear once again, in association to specific parts of real estate is unfounded. And to be honest, it's disingenuous because the people preaching the fear, if you go and look at the math, the math is, is, is saying a different story. And so what people do is they cherry pick one statistic and they show you one statistic and they say, this is the problem. If you believe one thing is the problem, that, that's a problem. You need three or four reasons for why something is the way it is. And if you dig past the one statistic they're using, there's always three or four reasons. And most of them are still decently positive. Sweet. All right. Stay tuned for next week. Yeah. <laughs>